This is an amazing piece of technology, not the laptop, the USB cable, because the laptop can do all sorts of amazing things, but the USB cable allows any other machine to do what this laptop can do because it can transfer information. Unless, of course, it's trying to transfer information to or from a machine that is fundamentally incompatible. And you know if you own these two machines, as I do, they don't want to talk to each other. Not only won't the transfer work, but if you try hard enough, you can break both of the machines. Now, teaching is essentially an attempt to transfer information from one mind to another. The information might be facts, the information might be skills, the information might be sensibilities, but it's an attempt to take things in here and install them in some way, shape, or form in there. Until students come with this technology, we have to rely on a much older one, which is language and communication, showing and telling. The way that I transfer information from my mind into the minds of the students who fill this amphitheater when I teach in the spring is by talking, is by showing, is by telling. But the concern I have is the same one we have with the laptop, namely, if there is not similarity, fundamental compatibility between my mind and theirs, the transfer will not work. This is a bad communication. And the reason is it's a differential equation and it's in a code and a language I understand, but many of you don't. Your machine is fundamentally incompatible with mine. It cannot accept this transfer of information. To teach, we have to know not only what we know, we have to know what our students know. Now that sounds simple, it sounds banal, it sounds trite. I want to convince you that it is not only the number one rule of teaching, but it is a miracle it ever happens. It's a miracle it ever happens, and every time it does happen, it is a triumph of the human mind over its natural ways of thinking. Now, this is Sari. Sari is my youngest granddaughter. She's two years old. Do you know what she's doing here? She's hiding. She's hiding. Now, if I didn't know, if I thought your mind was like mine, I'd just stop there and say, so there's my lecture. You get it, right? But I'm going to spend another 15 minutes explicating this picture. Sari hides when she's two by putting her hands over her eyes because she thinks if she can't see me, I can't see her. She thinks that what she, how she sees the world is how everyone sees the world. Not that they share her point of view. She doesn't know that there is such a thing as a point of view. She doesn't know that the world is viewed from a point. Because she's two. She hasn't learned that yet. And so I can do a game with Sarah. I can see, Sarah, there's a little boy. And there's two boxes in the room, a blue one and a red one. I'm going to put a marble in the blue box. Now the little boy is going to leave the room. He's going to go to the potty. And while he's out of the room, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the marble from the blue box to the red one. Now the little boy comes back. Say, Sari, where will he look for the marble? Because Sari is two, she says he will look in the red box. She thinks he will look where she would look. She knows it's there. That's where she would look. Why wouldn't he look there too? Now, if we take her older sister, Dalen, in this picture, I don't know, about six years old, she has no trouble telling me that the boy will look in the blue box, even though she knows that the marble is in the red box. Jean Piaget, the father of developmental psychology, had this to say many, many decades before Sari and Dalen were born. The child is only concerned with himself and ignores more or less completely the points of view of others. But in logic also, if the child sees everything from his own point of view, it's because he believes all the world to think like himself. He has not yet discovered the multiplicity of possible perspectives and remains blind to all but his own as if that were the only one possible. The child is a realist in its thought, and its progress consists in ridding itself of its initial realism. What Piaget was saying is, children think everybody thinks like them, but ultimately they grow up, and they go from being Sari to being Dalen, and they get that not everybody thinks the way they do. What we have learned since Piaget is that if egocentrism goes away, it does not get very far. Because you... You have to use a somewhat more sophisticated version of these tasks on adults, but adults will make the same mistake two-year-olds will. Here's an example. 
In scenario A, I have put a marble in the blue box, and the observer, the little boy, has now left the room. I'm now going to rearrange the boxes. I'm going to change their locations. Where will he look when he comes back? Now, if you ask Yale students this question, where the study was done, here's what they say. 71% say the little boy will look in the blue box. 23% say he'll look in the red box. In other words, those don't add up to 100 because some people aren't sure, but 71% of the students think the little boy will think the marble is still in the box of the same color, and 23% say no, the little boy will think it's in the same location. Neither of those answers is particularly right or wrong. But look what happens in scenario B. It's exactly the same scenario. We put the marble in the blue block box. We're going to rearrange the boxes. The only thing is, you know, you know, it's now in the red box. What happens? Well, if you're a Yale student, a certain percentage of you now start to say, I think people will probably look for the marble in its old location. I don't think they care about color nearly as much as location. What's happening here, of course, is that your knowledge of where the marble is, is changing your prediction about how another person will see the world. You don't need elaborate experiments if you are teachers, as most of you are, to know that this is true. It happens all the time. You're making an exam, and you have to figure out how hard the questions are. You don't want them to be too easy. You don't want them to be too difficult. You want them to be in that Goldilocks zone, just right. So what percentage of your students can name the animal that can drink 30 gallons of water in 10 minutes? Now, I could ask you this question, or I could ask it this way. What percentage of your students know that the animal that can drink 30 gallons of water in 10 minutes is a camel? These are identical questions, but they do not elicit identical answers from teachers. Because when teachers are asked to predict the percentage of their students who can answer this question, if they see the answer, the word camel, they go, I think, you know, 82% of my students will know it's a camel. But if you just ask the question, they say, yeah, yeah I really only think about 68% of my students will know it's a camel. And it's the latter group that's right. Because students don't get the word camel on the exam. So they don't say, would I have known this? They have to retrieve the word camel, and that's a whole lot harder. The same thing happens with students, right? When they're studying, they are studying for notes that have the answers. It's very hard for them to imagine if they will be able to recall the father of developmental psychology when they're looking at a notebook that says, Gilbert said Piaget was the father of developmental psychology. So both students and teachers are in this jam. Knowing the answer to a question not only makes the question seem easy, it makes it very hard for us to estimate how other people who don't share our knowledge will respond to it. Let me give you a simple demonstration. I'm going to tap a tune on my microphone. I'm going to tap the beat to a tune. And I want to see if you can guess the tune that I am tapping. It's a familiar tune. I think most of you know it. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give half of you the answer beforehand. Uh, let's say people in this wing, about a third of you. I'm going to give you the answer by flashing on the screen before I do the tapping. All of you, I want you to close your eyes for a moment while I put the answer on the screen. Your eyes are open. You're looking right at me. You have to close your eyes. Are they closed? You're peeking. Okay. Keep your eyes closed. There's the answer. Everybody see it? Okay, it's gone. Now, I'm going to tap the tune, and I'm going to ask these people to estimate what percentage of you will know the tune I'm tapping. Here's, here we go. Here's the tune. Okay. How many of you here think you know what tune I tap? You've seen this before. <laughs> Star Spangled Banner. Oh, what did you think it was? Happy birthday to you. Okay, I picked a bad tune. But here's what would have happened if we'd really done this as an experiment and I picked the right tune. You would have seen these results. These people, knowing it was happy birthday, couldn't help but hear, happy birthday to you. Those of you who didn't know it was happy birthday heard bump, 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 bump. And some percentage of you would get happy birthday and some wouldn't. When you really do this study with real people, here's what you find. You find that the predictors think that roughly half of the people will guess the tune. This is across a wide variety of tunes. And the actual number who guess it is about 2%. It's very hard to get tunes by tapping, though I have now learned that Happy Birthday is one of them that most people can get by. I'm going to use Rimsky Korsakov's Flight of the Bumblebee next time. 
Now, egocentrism, I said, goes away but doesn't get very far. I want to show you that we do learn something as we develop, but the lesson we learn might not be the one you think. This is what psychologists call a Khazar apparatus, or what normal people call a cheap set of wooden cubbies. And what you can see is that in these cubbies, there are a variety of little items, discs and cars, some Elmer's glue, but you can also see, do I have a laser here? I don't know. I, I, yeah, it doesn't matter. You can also see that some of them have a backing on them, so they are occluded. If you were to flip this around and look at it from the other side, you would not be able to see some of these items. Okay. This apparatus is used with adults to play a game. They're brought into the laboratory and they're assigned the role of director or subject. The director's job is simply to ask the subject to move things around the Khazar apparatus. So the director says things like, move the small red ring. And here's the question, what does the subject move? Because if you notice, the subject can see a very small red ring right over here, that the director cannot see because it's occluded. So what does the subject move? Does the subject move the small red ring from the director's point of view or the smallest red ring that he or she can see? Who thinks that the subject moved the smallest ring that he or she can see, not taking into account the director's view? Oh, come on, these are college students. They're not morons. They know that the director can't possibly see the littlest ring. And indeed, their hands move the correct ring. But they are being followed by an eye tracker. And what the experiment shows is that even though their hands go to the right ring, their eyes go to the wrong one. Which is to say, when they hear someone say, move the small red ring, their initial reaction is to move the ring that is smallest for them. And then they go, wait, I'm not two. That person can't see what I can see. He must mean. What this experiment tells us is that egocentrism doesn't just not go away. It's actually a fundamental part of the beginning of every one of our perceptual acts. When we hear, when we see, when we think, we do it first from our own point of view and only then sometimes, and not always sufficiently, take into account the fact that other people's points of view are not ours. This is what Piaget called egocentrism. It's what some psychologists refer to as the curse of knowledge. And the question, of course, is what we can do about it. The answer is not much. That's right. Study after study shows that it is virtually impossible to eliminate these effects. There is no magic pill. There is no magic bullet. There is no perspective-taking exercise you can do and be free of egocentrism. Indeed, studies show that even when people try their hardest, they still tend to make the kinds of mistakes I've shown you here. And we really shouldn't be surprised. Would you be successful if I said, I'd like you to just stop smelling French fries for a moment? Uh, please quit seeing the color green. Okay, hear what I'm saying without anything, without knowledge of anything your fourth grade teacher taught you. You can't do this. There's no off switch. You can't reach up and turn off what has been naturally turned on. This is pretty easy to demonstrate. Uh, some of you were alive in the 70s. Uh, some of you have taken courses in ancient history and have learned about the 70s. And in the 70s, there was a big, uh, there was a lot of to do about something called backward masking. It was discovered that certain rock groups were taking satanic imperatives and putting them backwards in their lyrics so that when children heard their music, they killed their parents. Now, this turned out to be idiotic, of course, and yet the data for it seemed pretty compelling. So here's a band, many of you may have forgotten Queen, and here's a very, here's a famous snippet from one of their songs. Another one bust the dust. Another one bust the dust. We're going to go back and get some volume on that. Freddie Mercury cannot be listened to at low volume. Another one bust the dust. Another one bust the dust. Ow! Another one bust the dust. Hey, hey! Another one bust Okay, now if you take that snippet and play it backwards, you hear this. Now, if you're like most people, you're going, yes, that's a man singing backwards. But as soon, as soon as I give you this phrase, listen to what you just heard.
Okay, now I want you to I want you to listen to it and not hear it's fun to smoke marijuana. Try. You're ruined. You're ruined. You're ruined by knowledge. You have become experts. You know something, and no matter how hard you try, you cannot unknow it and hear that song the way an innocent would hear it or the way you heard it 30 seconds ago. You can't go home again. What we can't do is simply rid ourselves of this childish egocentrism. What we can do is be aware of it. We can be aware that the way the world looks to us is not the way it looks to other people, particularly our students. The, the subjectivity of human experience is, from my point of view, the brute fact with which the humanities and all the human sciences must contend. I cannot ever fully invite you into my mind. I cannot ever fully inhabit yours. Like the child, I must always see things from my perspective. But unlike the child, I can be aware of that fact. And although my, although my eyes are not wise, I can guide the way my hands move. I'm going to stop there, and I know I have two minutes to ask you a polling question, but I also know that one of the rules of public speaking is that when you stand between people in a coffee break, you should get off the stage as quickly as possible. So I'm going to thank you instead for your kind attention.